other people back and some new guys. Did you sleep well? <laughs> so, my second session here. Oh, I make the classic mistake, misspelling my own name. I once forgot to write my own name completely on this slide. That was good. Yeah, there we go. And you can find me on Twitter too. And for, for the new guys here, I'm uh, from Denmark, Copenhagen, working in a consultancy company called Cortex Global. Um, and I'm the global lead developer. So I am in charge of scripting and developing in our company. Uh, so 75% of my time I work in customer projects and the rest I work in internal best practices and all that stuff and doing stuff like this. Yeah, I've been in the cloud and data center MVP for four years now um, for my work in Orchestrator, SMA and Azure Automation. So this is the advanced runbook design. And if you were here before, this is kind of actually the, the same, but we just pull it up a notch, make it a little bit more advanced, and I'll show you some, uh, some examples, different things. So first, we're going to talk about the Graph API. Has anybody tried the Graph API? Do you like it? Yeah, I talked to you at the party. You said, yeah, it rocks. Graph API is great. Azure Functions is great. I actually did this demo. Uh, one of these demos, or the first demo with Azure Functions in MMS last year. And I was doing it with a guy called Vlad Joanovich from Microsoft. And I had made a web app to do what this function should do. And I think it was a few days before MMS, he said, why don't you just use functions? And I said, what functions? Yeah, okay, we released it yesterday, so we might not have heard about it. <laughs> and then we changed the demo and showed it uh, two days later. It was so easy to take my uh, web uh, app that I made myself, web service, and just copy paste into Azure Functions, and then it ran as a function. You'll see that I'm making an Azure function in PowerShell in this example. So what are, the first scenario that I then want to show is a new email in Office 365 generates a new incident in the ITSM system, and in this case, it's ServiceNow. What's special about this is that I also transfer all the images and I edit the actual content so that the incident has a field with the email in it, and it, it looks exactly like when it was sent. Because that's an issue I've seen a lot at uh, customers is that they get an incident in the help desk, but uh, it doesn't look like the real email, which means that they don't know where to put each picture, and yeah, and sometimes that, that fails the communication then. Yeah, and that's the exporting should be down here. But then I'll talk about connectors and watchers. Watchers is a new functionality in Azure Automation, which is not uh, public yet. But luckily, I was allowed to show it uh, since I was planning on putting this in here. Uh, it was nice that they allowed me to show it. Um, uh, using those watchers, I'll make a connection from uh, SCUM to an ITSM system again. Again, it could be any system you want to connect to. Um, but the watchers can then transfer alerts whenever an alert is uh, selected for transferring. Then we'll look at exporting the runbooks and all the assets, and then a little debugging tip in the end. I forgot to send this, list, so now I've got a little extra time. Anyway, the Graph API. I actually did one demo where I had the Lord of the Rings music in the background, because the slogan is one endpoint to rule them all because that's what it says on the website, right? So the idea is that Graph API is your one entrance to the complete Office 365 and all the other online uh, solutions, like Intune, for instance. And you can connect to Graph API. You can actually uh, create users in, in Azure AD. You can set up machines in Intune. You can uh, change uh, stuff on OneDrive. You actually have a lot of different things. You go to graph.microsoft.com, um, and it actually shows uh, all the stuff that you can do. And this graphic is actually old because there should be much more on this list. So for instance, users, group, files, emails, notes, OneNote, contacts, tasks, and much more such as uh, Intune. Um, and this means that you can uh, easily connect. It's really made for developers, of course, for your own app, for instance, that can connect. Um, one thing you can do, which I'll use for my scenario here, is what's called a webhook subscription. 
So I can actually go in and make a subscription saying, okay, if this user account receives an email, you should call this webhook, which then triggers my automation. So I can set it on different things like create it, update it, or delete it, uh, so that if a mail or a folder is updated, for instance, with it could be files on, on OneDrive. Uh, so in this case, I'll use an email. If I receive the email, it's just uh, it just triggers my my runbook. Um, there's also the Outlook groups where you can trigger on conversations. And as I write here, so far because it's in the works to to extend this stuff. At least it's still in, in beta or preview, so who knows, there might become a lot of other support. Yep. So let's check out the first part of this example. We have Azure, we have Office 365 in there, uh, OMS Automation, ServiceNow, and we have our end users over here. Um, they send an email to Office 365, Office 365 calls a webhook, Webhook triggers the runbook, which connects to ServiceNow and creates the incident. This is how I would want it to work. But there is a, a but here because, because the Office 365 Graph API, when I create a subscription, it tries to connect to the, to the webhook with a specific URL, it, with a, what's called a validation token. Like this, it sends a validation token, and the webhook here has to, within five seconds, return the validation token to Office 365. So I had an, a little challenge here because in, in Azure Automation, you cannot change the way webhooks work. If you call a webhook, it triggers the runbook and it sends back the job ID. So I needed something in between to actually help me do this validation and then later help me trigger the runbook. And that's why I generated, created a C-sharp uh, web service that if it receives the validation token, sends it back uh, to Office 365, but if it, if it doesn't receive an validation token, it just sends the request through to the runbook. Yeah, so again, scenario here. Um, sends the email, but now I need my web service in between to actually trigger this stuff. And this is where Azure function is a really great tool for that. <clears throat> because I can make an Azure function, I don't need to worry about uh, coding the actual the actual uh, website uh, I mean the, the URL the, the, the um, I don't need to host it or anything I just write some PowerShell and I receive this um, uh, this um, yeah the request and then I can if I want to connect to webhook or I could send back the validation token and another great thing about Azure functions is that if you have a basic request <clears throat> they calculate in how much CPU time or memory you use. But if you have a basic request that only uses one instant, uh, one uh, uh, unit, or what they call it, you have one million, one million triggers a month for free. Yeah? <coughs> yeah, that's a good question. But the thing is, the Azure function doesn't have the whole asset store where I can save my credentials, and my, my service accounts to do the actual stuff I want. So that's why I want it in my automation. Also, I can connect my automation to <coughs> uh, sorry, OMS and have the logs in there. So it's, you have to steal the central thing, but you're right. In some cases, you could call directly. Yep. Let me show you the functions. <coughs> Again. Yeah. Actually, the first, um, sorry, have some feedback if I sit here. If I'm sitting here. No. <laughs> anyway, the first um, <coughs> thing is the actual uh, function. And I open this in here. And the function, you just create a, a function. You go to functions.azure.com uh, or in, in the portal and you create a function. You then select a template for the function <coughs> and a language. You can actually do it in PowerShell or C Sharp, or you could also do it in Batch if you want to. But I wouldn't re recommend Batch. Maybe for fun. But you then get a <coughs> you then get a, a, a standard example that actually can read some of the stuff. And you can see this is actually pretty simple because all this stuff up here, right here, is actually 
um, uh, what's uh, available from, from the beginning. And you can see they automatically create these variables saying, okay, if there is a, valid, uh, a, a token in the URL called validation token, they will put this validation token inside this variable automatically. And they can, then I can just write it out to the output and return and, and complete my function. So this will then return this. And then I in here I just have outputted some of the stuff that, <coughs> that, that it receives, so that just for logging purposes. And if it doesn't receive the validation token, it then gets the raw content and then sends it on to the webhook. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Another thing is that you can actually see here a log. <coughs> yeah, so you can see a log here, uh, exactly what is happening. You can also see some, in the monitor tab, you can actually see exactly what's going on in real time. So you see the triggering of the run book, oh, sorry, the function, and you can see the invocation log, except if the internet is really slow, of course see when it was triggered and what's happening. Um, and in here, you can actually select an input that could be a HTTP, it could be a, a, a queue, or it could be a, a, a different inputs that they support. A new thing in this is that if we go to here, we have this thing over here where we can actually view the files. So we could actually upload, we could upload uh, modules for PowerShell, use those in our function. So let's try this uh, example here. The thing is that I've registered this uh, uh, subscription and I'll get back to how I do that and what are the requirements on that. So if I send an email here to my Runbook account, PSCon EU test one, you see that I have a picture here. I did some more pictures down here. And what I want is the actual uh, email to look the same. I also put in, let's say, a little screenshot like that. So what happens is when I trigger this, it sends in the actual request to the runbook. The runbook reads the email, downloads all the files that are attached to the emails, all the images, creates an incident in ServiceNow. Um, it then uploads the files to ServiceNow and then it figures out what are the new uh, references to the files. It then edits the email and then inserts all that stuff into the incident. Yeah, okay, so test two. <laughs> we send this. And, and what's cool about these uh, webhooks is of course, as if you were in my last session, you heard that it's very nice to that they trigger very quickly. Um, you might see one that has failed here, but that was because my service now was not running, which you also saw in my session if you were here before. Uh, but very soon you see already now it triggers because it received that email, executes the runbook on my hybrid worker in Denmark because if I run it in Azure, there's some limitation of how much memory I can use. And if I really want to handle large files, for instance, in my uh, attached files, then I should run it on my own server. Hybrid worker, it triggers, you see it creates an incident, here's the number, it uploads each of the files to the actual incident. Uh, and then it, it, while we wait there, you can see that uh, let's find it here. It's the new graph API in Runbook. And the thing is, the graph API doesn't have a PowerShell module uh, officially, but I made one myself for this, which you can find on the gallery called the graph API. And I see there's another guy also on, uh, online who has made another module uh, where he has a bit more functionality than mine. Uh, mine is actually, you can log in, you can do the, um, uh, update of subscriptions and you can run custom queries so you can actually do anything but there's not many commandlets specified for each of the things you want to run. You can see here invoke graph request and you then invoke a specific, specific URL and that actually gets me the, um, the email in JSON. 
And what's actually cool about this is that all the files, when we get those, are in a, in a format called base64 encoded. And what does ServiceNow need? It needs the same format. So great, I don't even have to save a file on the, on the, on the computer. I just grab the JSON from, from, um, uh, from, the, from Graph API and then I send the same uh, JSON to, to uh, <laughs> ServiceNow and it becomes a file in ServiceNow. Yep, so down here we go in and send. Unfortunately, they don't always use REST web services, so there's also a SOAP call. Um, and you can see actually here, which I didn't show before, that, that it had triggered the actual function, sent on to the, to the uh, webhook, and I got the ID back from the actual uh, triggering of the, um, the webhook. Let's go back and see. It has completed successfully, which means, of course, that if I look in my incidents, I should have the incident here. Luckily, I did. And oh, I just need the correct view so you can see. The field. I created a field in ServiceNow called email. And you can see here, well, it hasn't loaded this yet, but the picture is there. You can see the picture on my... Uh, in my um, in my signature, they are all there. You see the email, except it right now has one issue that it doesn't know Danish letters, <laughs> but but otherwise it, it works as it should. So this is more like a proof of concept that you can actually make a connector that does really advanced stuff like mo modifying the data before it's sent it into to any system. And you could of course make a, as much uh, advanced stuff as you want. Maybe you want the incident to be sent to specific groups or stuff like that. So, but these subscriptions, subscriptions, they have a limitation of they only work for maximum of three days. So at least once every three days, you have to go in and update the, the subscription and make it work for three more days. Uh, actually, when I tested this in the beginning, uh, when you want to remove a subscription, you need to send the ID of the subscription, of course. You get an ID when you register, but I forgot to write down mine, so every time I receive an email, it triggered like 30 runbooks because I tested again and again. It's, uh, it's called a webhook subscription in the Graph API. So it's a special, special function they have where you can actually go in and you can um, uh, you can go in and you can actually select what which oh let me find the right one here you can uh, select which which uh, things to monitor mail folders inbox messages and then uh, which URL it has to call and what uh, when it does have to call it so you register this with Graph API which means that when it receives this email it calls the URL. When I register, I get a subscription ID, which you see here, which I then can use to remove the subscription again later. But the thing is, I need to actually, I need to actually go in and update these every, every uh, three days. So of course, what did I do? I made a schedule run book to go in and update these things. But I need somewhere to actually save the information, the settings, which URL and all that. And I could, of course, use an XML file. I could use a custom DB to save this stuff. Uh, but I could also use a SharePoint site, which you just saw, yeah? Yeah, but, yeah, but what I wanted is to support more than one, so I would require a lot of variables because I need three values for each. Uh, and, of course, I could do, let it, let's say, a comma separated. Sorry? Yeah, a JSON, I could do that. So, but I wanted to use SharePoint since I'm a SharePoint fan. Are you? <laughs> Calling all the SharePoint fans, right? So this is the picture of the SharePoint fans. So you all know everybody likes SharePoint. Anyway, as I talked about in my last session, SharePoint is a great easy way to save stuff like this. So uh, <laughs> what I did was uh, to go in, create the SharePoint list, as I said, and it could be anywhere, this information. I select what it should uh, monitor and which 
a credential asset it should use to connect to create. A, you need a, a, an account that has, has access to that mailbox. So it uses a specific credential from my Azure automation. And then have a change type, created, updated, deleted, and then my notification URL. But this is not, of course, the direct URL to my, uh, to my webhook in Azure Automation. This is to my Azure function, and then with some information in the end about which runbook to trigger. See, token here in the end. And it just looks like this. So this means I can every single day at, at noon, I connect in, and I just find it here. Every day at noon, I uh, connect and I update these, uh, update the subscriptions right here. And you see, when you create a subscription, you get a reply saying, when does it expire? And also the ID and whatever URL you try to execute. And I, of course, then found out it's a good idea to put a disabled or not, so you can actually set if they are disabled here. Of course, you could call it enable instead, but this is just how it ended up. So this is a very nice way to, to, to save stuff like this, so we can easily, from a runbook, go in and pick up what does need to be configured and update it. And you can see the one running here. It says it last updated it yesterday, um, and it now it works until uh, Saturday or Sunday. Yeah? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. I think one of the reasons is that if you had something running for, let's say, a year, and, and you forgot about it, uh, or you forgot the ID, so you couldn't remove it again, then you'll be, you'll be, be kind of stuck with the, the same subscription for for one year and, and you wouldn't, did, didn't have any way to, to actually remove it. Another thing is that this is still in preview and beta, so it could be something that they change. Uh, but I think the, the issue is that they want us to make sure that we still have them active. Um, and luckily, we have the run books for that. But I agree, it, it could be, in my opinion, we could say it should be a bit more, let's say a month, for instance. But I still think it's a good idea that they expire at some point because otherwise you end up maybe triggering too much because you did some mistakes, right? But, but I agree it's a good question. Yeah. So, next up is watchers. Has anybody heard of Runbook Watchers or Watcher Tasks? They showed it at Ignite, um, and I'm so lucky that I, well, it's not pre a, a, a public preview yet, but I was uh, allowed to, to show it. The idea is that when you want to monitor something and you don't, you don't have the option to actually trigger using a webhook, for instance, you need to poll every, let's say, every minute or every five minutes or every 15 minutes for something. And in Azure Automation, you pay per minute for these runbooks to run. So this means that if you make an infinitely running runbook, it costs you more money than it should. All right, so that, that's why Runbook Watcher Task or Watchers are coming. A Runbook Watcher Task contains two runbooks. We have a Watcher Runbook that can go and check for something. Let's say, in my case, it's checking for new alerts in Scum. It's free to run the, the Watcher Runbook. You can run it only on the hybrid worker, but it's free to run. And right now, the limit is a maximum of 30 seconds per run. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to change. Um, so this means that the actual infinitely running check is free. But whenever we have something that we want to take action on, we execute a specific commandlet that triggers an action run book. And in here, we have all the integration options that we have in any other run book. But in that case, we don't. We pay for the minutes the action uh, run book runs. This is great for polling for stuff and triggering something now and then and whatever you need. So we can then run the action run book in Azure or in Hybrid Worker. Yep. So my example here is we have Scum and we have Automation and we have a Watcher run book and we have ServiceNow again. 
you might think I only work in service now, but it's just a, a nice uh, system to, to use for demos and a lot of customers in Denmark are using it. So we have an agent that, can, that detects something and generates an alert. In my case, I've said that if you then change the alert to a specific resolution state, the watcher runbook picks it up and starts the action runbook, which then connects to service now and creates new incident. And then it sends back and then it saves the incident number on the actual alert. So you can see that in scum. So it in uh, so it's actually a, a scum connector for for the uh, for the alerts. And again, this system here could be any system, of course. It just depends on the, the, the which module, PowerShell module or API you use to send the stuff. Yeah. Let's try this. Here we have the uh, watch a task. It just pops up in your automation account. Um, and you can then, one of these watch a task, as I see if I create one, you see that it contains you see that my internet is really slow. Oh no. Anybody using the speaker Wi-Fi? <laughs> Stop streaming Netflix on the speaker Wi-Fi. Anyway, very slow. Uh, but you, you create these watches and you can see I have a few of them. Um, there we go. I can set the name of it, I can set how often it should run in minutes so far, and then we can select a, a watcher runbook and an action runbook. So it's very simple to create one of these watcher tasks. When you create it, you then have the option to, well it starts of course, it runs, but you can of course stop it if you want to. In this uh, watcher task, you can then see what's going on. So if I select this one, you see that I can, I can see the, the um, the run book, that was the watcher run book. I can see the watcher streams, which is either errors or successfully triggered action run books. So if one of the watchers triggers the action run book, it will be in this stream. And also if it sends out an error, it will also come into this list. Yeah? No, there's no, nothing specific that needs to be done on the hybrid burger. So you just, but the thing is, this is not public yet. So, so far you need to open a specific secret URL to, that's why it's orange here. And I don't know the time frame for when it actually comes out. But, yeah. Yeah. I should uh, show you that. Let's see. Uh, maybe we can do a little song while we wait. <laughs> I thought it was good internet for the speakers. No. Anyway, it is simple PowerShell code. It's actually, right now it supports PowerShell scripts, so you can run workflows, but you can trigger scripts. And you can, and you can use the, any module that you are used to. The only, the, the only limitation you have is the 30 second maximum runtime limit per execution of this. I don't know again if that's something that will keep, uh, stay there because this is a very early preview. Um, Exactly. So every instance of running it, that it triggers can run for 30 seconds, otherwise you get an error. I don't know why it's so slow. It worked before. Let me try a new one here. Okay, so this is the, the watcher run book, and actually I could also show it in here. Call it watchers, come alerts, and it's just a simple um, Actually, I, I should remove these assets up here since I don't use them anymore. Um, these ones are not needed for ServiceNow because it's the action run book that connects to ServiceNow. But I have then, in, in my case, I, I use JSON or sorry, a, a hash table to define one or more configurations for SCUM environments. I recently made one for a customer with four different environments. So they, but that was not a watcher, that was just a run book. But this is where, what I use for the base of this. So it has the name of the SCOM account, uh, uh, management group, the server name, and what credential in my asset store it needs to use to connect to that system. Then I have a variable to actually uh, say when was it last run. 
because I need to use that to figure out what uh, uh, alerts has been updated. And uh, when I've read that uh, date, I save it uh, again, save the current date into that, um, so that next time it runs, it gets the, the, the new date. Then I go in for each scum environment, and I open a connection using standard scum uh, commandlets, using get alerts to get my, my alerts using that last date. Between the last date and the current date, I want those alerts, but I only want them if they are, have a specific uh, resolution state here. And actually I see this is not the newest version, so let me just download the newest version. You see, because I always also check that the ticket ID is nothing or is null. It's normally null, but if you already set one and removes it, it might be empty text string, so that's why I just for safety put that in there. Then for each alert that it receives, I then pick up uh, the alerts here. Um, I I do remove some of the some of the properties because there's so much data in, in an alert that I don't need, so I only put in properties that I actually need. Um, and I make a new property called management group, so I have an easy way to, to see that. But then comes these lines here where I actually trigger the invoke automation watcher action, which is a specific watcher commandlet. You put it in a hash table, whatever data you need in your action runbook, and then you just trigger this command and, and send, send the, the hash table with all the information. This then goes to the action runbook. It's this one, which is, again, scum environments are uh, because I need to connect back to the scum environment to actually update the alert and the connection to service now. But then I re receive what's called the event data. You see, I make this event data object up here. So the invoke uh, action sends to this event data and it sends a lot of information to that um, to, to the runbook. And I think I'll actually just jump into a slide here so you can see an overview of what it sends. So it sends like an event, the ID of the event, timestamp, when did it happen. It has the message which I send in my, my commandlet and the watcher name. And then it has this thing called property back which contains all the custom, uh, uh, the hash table that I sent to the uh, to the actual runbook. So in my case, alerts, and then all the information about the alerts. And then I can of course read it, like the, the stuff on top here, just read the property bag, and I got all the objects uh, directly in my runbook. So this is just running forever. Um, when I receive these alerts, I can then just go through the alerts since it's object. But you see it's, it comes in as JSON, so I just convert it from JSON into objects. And then I can handle them, create them in service now, pick up the number right here, and put that on the scum alert. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's not allowed to do in, in Watchers. Uh, you, are, you are limited that you cannot start other runbooks. You might be able to do tricks like using the, the REST API or something like that to do it, but I don't think there is a reason to do it because this is uh, easy to use and you can then inside when you select the actual, and you create the Watcher, you then select, let's see, you then select which runbook should be run. So in fact, it is almost the same, except you only have the event data input, just like a webhook input. So, so yeah, I understand it's a good question, but, uh, but I, I think there, at least internally, you cannot just run another uh, a runbook, but yeah, you might be able to work around that. So you see the watcher streams here, triggers if it has a um, if it triggers the action you'll see it here and if it has an error for example running too long I did a little test to make it run too long um, it has this error instead you'll also see that if you get any real errors I mean if it fails or I made one that 
fails on purpose here. You see that those errors appears in here and we got the right uh, information which uh, command failed. But you don't have any other information like the output or verbose progress, at least not in this uh, preview. Then if it triggers the run book, you can then see it as a, an ex, uh, um, as a job here, of course, which triggers just like a normal run book and executes whatever you need. You see that this one has triggered and I got all my, I got one alert and it connects to service now and it creates this incident. Let's just try it here. Here's my alerts. Luckily, I got lots of alerts in my development environment. You see, actually, this one down here has 3.1 million repeats. So this is just these are about 6 million alerts. So I did trigger some alerts at least. Change it to the resolution state service now. Wait for it to trigger every minute, um, which triggers the the runbook job here. And of course the action runbook can run as long as you want. You see, they're tr triggered, queued it for the for execution on hybrid worker, but I could have executed it on Azure if I wanted to. Actually, in this case, I only executed on hybrid worker because it starts quicker, but uh, in, in, in real life, this doesn't wouldn't require uh, the hybrid worker. Oh, failed. That's not so good. <laughs> Why did it fail? So maybe it already went to sleep again, my instance. That would be so typical. Same issue I had last uh, <laughs> session. You see. And it's a bit hard to show quickly when, when the internet is really slow. Um, failed. I don't want to wait for it to open. Well, I think I made a mistake in my my uh, preview runbook here because it doesn't say any errors, but it still failed, uh, which is not best practice, of course. Of course, it worked all the other times. The only reason it failed before was that my my, my website was uh, my service now was not running, so it actually failed. But if we, if it had worked, like it usually does, uh, I would have received uh, the number back, and then you can see I update the actual incident uh, uh, with the incident ID here. Hmm. So, good question: Why it actually failed? It failed when it reads the create service now incident. So. Not sure exactly why. The notification now up here. It just said the watch the task is started from when I when I started it. Anyway, this is, has actually nothing to do with <laughs> with with my uh, watcher. It just my action run book apparently didn't connect correctly to service now, and I'm not exactly sure why. But I, I did uh, get all the info. You can see if I look into these, you see in the input here, I did get all the information about the alert. It's a bit uh, hard to read here, of course, but you see the alerts right here. Um, and the context and whatever fields are on the alert, but it's very encoded here because it's JSON inside JSON. So it's like double uh, escaped, which why it looks so weird. In this GUI. All right. So I'm looking forward to see uh, the progress of the of the uh, uh, watcher runbook feature. And you see, I just put in a slide 
how you actually send these things to the to the watcher action and information layer. So I just had a few pitfall, pitfalls, but before I say them, remember this is based on a very early preview and it's not even uh, public yet. But um, you have the uh, maximum runtime of 30 seconds. And actually I should have changed my little slide here because this one is not true. There we go. Go on, everybody forgot about that. Uh, watch is maximum runtime, 30 seconds. What, one thing uh, that caught me when doing this demo uh, was that when you create the watch itself, it reads the, the source code of the watcher runbook. And if you change the watcher runbook, it doesn't change in the watcher. And that is good and bad because then you know that if the watcher is running, it uses a specific version of the runbook, uh, which means that it doesn't suddenly break because somebody changes the runbook. On the other hand, if you need to change the watcher runbook, you need to delete the watcher and uh, create it again. Luckily, it takes like three clicks to create a, a watcher, so it's not that um, it's not that uh, hard to do. Another thing is that you only see errors and invoke actions in the watcher log. Okay, so I would wa I wanted to do some tool to actually help export stuff from from uh, Azure Automation. So in SMA, there is a tool called uh, Export Tool, Import Export Tool. Uh, made by Jim Britt, uh, and I use that as a as an inspiration, uh, and I make this uh, demo proof of concept of how to export runbooks, which I'll share on the on the GitHub. And I will say first that this is a I don't know what to call it pre preview. It's an alpha first version, so it doesn't support everything. But the idea is that to, uh, you can ask it to export a runbook, and it needs to figure out which other runbooks are used by this runbook, and it exports those two. And then it goes through all of the runbooks, figure out which assets are used, and then it exports that too. And then you can go back, go to a, to use the module again, and, and import the same stuff in another account. And since I had to set up these demos, and I wanted to move from one Azure account to another, I had to make this tool to actually make it easier for myself. This uh, makes it much uh, simpler to actually export a runbook find it here. So first I need to log on. I import this module that I made, import export, and I set up a runbook name and an output folder. And just to show, I have the output folder here. There's nothing in it. Um, set up name, output folder, check if the output folder exists and create it if it doesn't. And then I can execute the export script runbook, type in the resource group name, automation account name, and the runbook name and the output folder and it'll go through the runbook and I export all child runbooks and everything I need. Let's try that. So it, it picks up my handle Twilio SMS and, and this uses more of those and sometimes it exports the same twice. I said it was a very early <laughs> alpha. Um, but then it had actually ex exported everything and what we get here is folder and in the folder we have the PS1 files directly if we want to, or both in published and in draft version if there is two different ones. Uh, and then we also have these XML files which are the same format as were used in SMA, in the SMA tool, which contains more than just the runbook. They contain uh, tags or the settings of the runbook, like if there's logging enabled, contains the exact runbook for, for the published and for the draft version, and it contains if any assets are used. Let me try another one, which actually uses assets. Uh, see, this one. Oh, sorry. Actually, these, none of these actually <laughs> use assets. But uh, but what it would happen here is that it actually exports um, yeah, also the assets into this XML. Uh, of course, not the password of the user accounts and all that. 
uh, but it, it has the names of them, uh, it has the variables uh, and, uh, and the values unless they are encrypted, which means we can use this and with the import command to import the whole thing in another environment. And that is exactly what a consultant like me uh, would love to have because I can then make a package of these runbooks and then place it at one customer or the other. And other people, uh, or at the same customer or at your environment, you can then use it to transfer from test to production uh, and make sure you have everything that the runbook actually needs. Yeah? Yes? We actually have the import function, and that's actually a bit stupid that I didn't uh, prepare. Uh, I put it on on GitHub uh, as a um, as a uh, repo there, and also the Graph API module that I talked about is also on GitHub. So if you want to change something uh, or uh, report issues or uh, join in in my little project, you can. You are very welcome to do that. But here you can see. Actually, I should run this in a new because I need to log on to another account. So I log into another account here. Um, if it had tags before. Ah, so add some more tags to them. Mm, yeah, I don't know what you mean. Uh, that's a good idea. Yes. That's also one of the uh, challenges we have. Let's just see here. Let's try another one. I actually didn't test it on other ones, but since I already have this runbook in my environment, let's try with precautions. It's a uh, alpha pre preview. <laughs> Let's just see. yeah, uh, I completely agree. And actually, that was kind of like because it took it from the uh, from the other tool and used some of the same structure. And I just didn't think about it. And I thought actually, this on my to do list. That's number one to change, of course, the format to JSON because that's easier to work with. Uh, so it's a very good idea. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I see. But uh, in this case, I'm actually transferring from one uh, to another subscription. But 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 you're right. If you have like assets that that is has some names that that that, that has uh, yeah maybe it has a name that that references that uh, account or something like that, it could be difficult to. Uh, but otherwise, uh, in this case, I don't. Uh, there's no problem because if we create a new runbook. It doesn't import it like. I mean, you could export like an ARM template. Yes. Yeah, that's something uh, that you should be able to select, override or not. Right now, it, it skips them uh, if they already exist. And let's just uh, say, okay, it already exists, it doesn't care. But again, this is first version. I'll try to to enhance stuff like that. In the, and again, it's and you're welcome to help also. Oh, see, I tested it on a, a runbook that I haven't used before. Uh, and there is some, some things here that actually fail. Um, but the idea is to actually import it again uh, to the other system here. Yes, it did export some of it. 
we enable the ECT5 user, it's the run book. Um, and the child run book. Um, and, let's see here. Yep. and we can then import it. But I, I'll make sure to, to work some more on it very soon so we can actually use it uh, properly. Oh, sorry. Let's just execute it all. Oh, nice blue, uh, red screen. <laughs> I might have should have uh, tested it a bit more. But I hope you see the point, and, and as I said, I will work more on it so it can actually be a, a tool that can work uh, properly because it's something that, that I've been wanting to make for a long time. Uh, probably you have the same right. So, and again, you are welcome to join in uh, and change it or write to me, why did you use XML when that's from 10 years ago? <laughs> All right. So. The final thing I have here is just a simple uh, little trick that I use a lot, and it might be simple, but it's actually something that we some ha that had helped me a lot to improve my workflow when I uh, make scripts. Um, the thing is that when you make a script, um, and you and you have an error, of course, the script sometimes stops if it's a simple script, and then you can in, uh, investigate the error. But sometimes you want to to uh, let's say it's a uh, for example a for each and you have like a hundred different items and then number 77 fails and and then you when you're finished you don't have the actual error uh, easily um, uh, to, to investigate I know there's the list of errors in dollar error but sometimes that's just not enough and it can take a while to actually find the right one and so on so what we I do a lot is to to create a, what's called a trap. Trap was, has anybody used a trap before? It was in PowerShell version one, before we had try catch. Um, and let me just find it. Oh, it's in the other, here. Uh, error trap. So this is a trap uh, that we could use to lock some error if we want to. But the whole idea for, for debugging is that inside the trap, I put this on top of my script, which means that any error in the script will be picked up by this trap. And then I can actually do a breakpoint here, like that. And this means that if any error uh, happens while my script is running, it will break before the actual script ends. Which means I have the option to investigate what are in the different uh, um, uh, variables and what is in the error and how should I continue. I could actually make this more advanced so I could maybe make a decision if I want to continue or not. In this case, if I execute, I run a get process test. I don't have that process, so it becomes an error, which means I have the error available up here. Uh, and I can then investigate not just the error, but any other, um, like uh, let's go for my at list available, of course, star. Uh, force and you'll see I got the error here uh, information I can check the inner error or the aggregated error or whatever <laughs> errors you have in the on the exception inner exception and, and messages and so on this has it's a sim simple trick but it's uh, actually in some cases have helped uh, me speed up my my development a bit yes I mean or another debugger <laughs> Oh, in that case, you will have to write the, the, the message it's out somewhere. Or you can choose to run your script in your same scope as you are so that you have the, some information available. But yeah, this is for, for debugging using a debugger. Of course, you could also use the set breakpoint command, set ps breakpoint command, and you could actually even if you execute it in the console, you could actually have it stop there. Uh, but in, uh, in, in my opinion, it's much easier to debug in, a, in an editor than in the console, but sometimes you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then, then you have a, an issue in, in, in actually um, figuring out the actual content of the error. Then you'll have to maybe make some, some, uh, some code to actually read if there is any inner uh, exception or inner, inner exception or aggregate exception. You might all have seen the errors uh, from, 
different systems going one or more error occurred, which is of course because they have an aggregate exception and that means inside the error exception itself you can figure out what were the errors that occurred. But you're right, when you execute it in Azure you then have the issue of, um, uh, of not having the debugger. But, but what I do usually is to, to, to work from my hybrid worker, at least in test, uh, so I know that it has the right executing on the right server, the right modules and all that. Uh, and then we can, since we have the add-on here, you can execute the runbook directly here and use this, this technique. And then when I know it works there, I can then send it to Azure and test it. Again, I put it in the slides also, and also on the in the GitHub. So the summary here, before we have some questions, is that the Graph API rules them all. As they say, it's the endpoint to rule them all because it has everything in, in the Microsoft Online, or at least it's supposed to have that when it's finished. Um, watcher runbooks can be used for monitoring instead of paying for infinitely running runbooks. And use SharePoint list if you like. Uh, it's a nice quick way to save these settings. And then when my export tool works, you can then use that to actually export your runbooks or complete solutions and then import it into new environments. So, any questions? Nope. Um, Actually, I'm not sure. Is anybody uh, the answer for that question? No? <laughs> I'm actually not sure why they call it graph. I was wondering that too. Yeah. Okay, so, so that, so, so you mean the graph.microsoft.io or? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so this, uh, this uh, is my. Okay. Maybe I wrote it wrong then. But but it is the, this one that, that my uh, my thing connects to. But uh, wasn't it called Outlook API before? Okay. Because I, I first made a module for what's called I Outlook API, and then I found out the graph was the new combined one, and you can actually see in here that. There's a lot of things you see in Tune and SharePoint, whatever. And this was the webhooks I talked about, subscriptions, and then you create this subscription. Um, and you send this information, which makes it trigger your, your stuff. Oops. Yeah, so, but good question about the name. <laughs> yeah? Mm. Yes, you have to, uh, when you connect it to the Graph API, you, you have to register a, an app and use the client ID and all that. Um, so what I did in my, in my uh, script or my module is that I support what's called a connection. Uh, let's see. Actually, I don't use that in this example, but you see we have the client ID, and the redirect URL, and we have a credential, and those is combined with a commandlet, at least in my version, that is called get, get graph auth token, and this will, then, this will then go up and authenticate, give you the token, and then when you invoke the graph request on the next line, you just need to send the token that you have, uh, and it will actually execute the, um, the command or the, the query that you need. Yeah, so, but what I did was to actually make these connections so that if I look into my, my assets in here, uh, when you import the module in Azure Automation, okay, am I blind? <laughs> when you import the module here, it, it gets a specific asset connection type, Graph API, um, which connect, contains these, this information. Well, I can show it because the password is not shown. Uh, you see the tenant, the client ID, and all that stuff, and you can send this object to the to the command led instead. 
and it will handle the connection. But this is specific for Azure Automation, of course, and then and also SMA. Yeah. So. So, any more questions? Nope. Okay, if you want to contact me, I'm on Twitter, and oh, yeah, I have a blog and all that. So you can just write if you want. Yep, thank you. <laughs>